Well, I'm here today with Justin and James from the executive team at Remedy, our awesome member benefits partner, and really leaders on the front lines with regards to helping our community manage through COVID-19. So thank you guys so much in advance just for everything that you've been doing, for your testing, for helping our community um, interpret and understand what's going on. Big shout out and thanks to all of you and all of your workers too. Thank you. Yeah, we've, we've really got a great team that have been focused on this. Yeah, so it's my understanding, James, that you are leading the way for Remini in terms of um, setting up the mobile testing sites that you've established. You test both for COVID-19 itself, but also you're doing the antibody testing now. Is that right? That is right. Yep. So we're, we're doing both the diagnostic testing, which is that really long nasal swab that feels like somebody's trying to access the center of your brain. The brain um, yeah. That is the, uh, that's the best way to diagnose an active case of COVID-19. And then we are also doing antibody testing um, at all of our sites um, with the blood draw to help people understand whether they've been exposed and recovered from the illness. Where is your testing site in the Austin area? Uh, in Austin, we're, um, we're operating at the Tony Burger Center um, mm -hmm. in South Austin. So just south of 290 um, at the athletic center there. And how does somebody get a test? Do they have to be referred from another physician or are they referred through Remedy directly? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is, um, there's no drive up testing without an advanced appointment. Mm -hmm. um, so the way to access testing is to visit myremedy.com um, where 24 hours a day, you can book a virtual encounter with one of our providers uh, who will see you briefly by video, ask some, uh, some clinical background questions, about your health history to help contextualize, you know, the results of the test that we perform, and then they will schedule you for a visit uh, to come to one of our drive-through testing facilities and be tested. How discerning does your team have to be about who gets a test and who doesn't? So, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, certainly that's been one of the uh, big areas of focus for us as we've been uh, going through this process. You know, typically a medical practice has um, about one supplier that they buy everything from um, and uh, one lab partner that they used to process labs. So we've been uh, in the course of the pandemic um, forming new partnerships, balancing the volume across those. Um, we have access to plenty of testing capacity right now. We are not restricting the administration of tests um, at any of these sites for the diagnostic test or for the antibody test. Okay, and what are the big trigger symptoms that would lead to uh, the demanding or authorizing of, a, of an ex a test, a diagnostic test? Yeah, so um, first of all, you don't have to be experiencing symptoms to have either of those tests. Um, one of the things that we know about COVID-19 is that, um, that there is a certain level of asymptomatic carrying uh, of the virus, um, which can put you at risk of exposing somebody else to transmission, even if you're not experiencing any symptoms at all. So um, typically, uh, when folks are coming in for the diagnostic test, it's because either they are experiencing some kind of symptoms or because they've had some kind of exposure where they're concerned that they may have had a risk of transmission. Um, and even if you don't have any symptoms, um, that can be a good idea to get tested. The most common symptom profile is a lot like the seasonal flu. So um, the, the most common symptoms are going to be fever uh, and a dry cough. Um, those are the, the two symptoms that most people present with, but there really are a, a pretty broad range of other possible symptoms that can be associated with COVID-19, and it affects everybody differently. So some other things to keep an eye out for uh, include sore throat, um, a headache that's not going away or is not typical of a headache experience you would normally have. Um, there are potential intestinal um, stomach issues. Um, nausea, diarrhea, um, stomach pain or discomfort um, are also possible symptom profiles. One of the, uh, one of the symptoms that's not uh, something you typically would think of as, a, as something that goes with being sick, um, that tends to manifest itself in uh, lower severity cases is a loss of taste or smell. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the, the most recent study data that's come out suggests that in people who don't experience a serious symptom profile, that uh, a loss of taste and smell is potentially the most conclusive um, sign or indicator that you may be experiencing an asymptomatic or a very low level um, infection with COVID-19. 
Um, when do you recommend the use of the antibody test? What's, it, what's the value of it at this point and kind of why and, and how and when should people get it? Um, I would say the, the uh, general thinking with antibody testing is that if you have antibodies present in your system, that you have probably developed some level of immunity to future infection. What we don't well understand yet is just how much immunity you develop um, after recovering from COVID-19. And so um, we certainly always caution people uh, as they're engaging with us for antibody testing that this is a good way to, to sort of gain better insight into a recent illness you might have had or whether you've had exposure uh, to the disease Certainly the broad consensus in the medical community seems to be um, that there is some level of immunity um, that you achieve after recovering from COVID-19. Uh, we don't yet know how long it lasts uh, or how complete it is. So if you think about uh, the common cold, for example, um, that's also caused by another strain of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, we all get the cold, you know, the common cold every year or many of us do. Um, and so, um, with some coronavirus infections, there's very little immunity that you achieve in recovering from the infection. Good reason to believe um, that there is uh, some significant level of immunity that you achieve with COVID-19. Um, there's been, uh, there have been pretty promising results so far with what's called convalescent uh, plasma donation, where the antibodies from a person who has recovered are used to treat a person who is, is right now acutely sick with the illness. Mm -hmm. um, that's both encouraging as a potential treatment protocol. It also is encouraging in terms of the likelihood that there will eventually be an effective vaccine and that a person who has recovered from the illness does have some level of protection as they go back out and re-engage with society. Um, it isn't, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, that antibody results at this point are um, sort of a, a get out in public free card. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't understand enough about what level of protection is achieved. Yeah, so so if you decide to pursue the antibody testing, you might get a little peace of mind, but should still be pretty cautious in your interactions moving forward because it's we have indecisive information about the extent to which that matters for you. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, I would say the other the other value of antibody testing um, is that it offers the potential to help us better understand how COVID nineteen has spread and right. to what level it has penetrated in these communities and what the level of prevalence has been. Okay. And so that's not really a personal health benefit, but it is a public health benefit. Sure. Um, and uh, lots of uh, lots that we gain by better understanding, you know, what its movement has been through our communities. Yeah, a public health benefit is the name of the game at this point, right? Is that it takes the collaboration of the community at large to manage what we're working against at this point. So let's talk a little bit about that. Our members are in business that has been deemed essential all along, but it's also business that is relatively high contact when conducted traditionally. So, sure. you know, I, I think we know the basics, but I want to make sure that we're giving them everything that they need. They need to keep people six feet apart. They need to keep face masks on. They need to sanitize stuff. What else would you be advising realtors to be thinking about as they're conducting their business needs? Yeah, I mean, I would say that you hit the most important points there. Um, Certainly, I think this is a great time to think about um, how you can incorporate virtual tours um, yeah. and technology in your business to help people see uh, the properties that you're trying to market without having to engage in those in-person interactions. Um, those have always been great, obviously, but, but especially right now, uh, to whatever extent you can leverage those technologies to reduce the risk of, of possibly transmitting the virus is, is a great idea. Um, I think the um, maybe the most important point to keep in mind there is that uh, masks of the kind that we're all wearing right now, um, you know, surgical face mask or a fabric face mask uh, that you've made at home yourself or purchased um, from a supplier, um, are most effective when both of the people interacting are wearing one. The risk of transmission when both people have a mask on is really pretty low. Um, it goes up dramatically if either of those people take their mask off. Um, the most important person to have a mask on is somebody who has an active infection, um, but it really multiplies the effect to have both people uh, having that protective barrier um, in order to reduce the risk of transmission. 
And then I would say it's, it's all the other things you mentioned. So, you know, good um, general hygiene and disinfection, um, you know, common cleaners, bleach, et cetera, um, will all uh, take care of potential contamination on household surfaces. Um, if you're using hand sanitizer, make sure that it is that it's coming from somebody who knows how to make hand sanitizer and has an adequate percentage of alcohol. Yeah. Um, it's gotten easier, certainly, to find those supplies, um, but it can still be a struggle. Um, and so uh, making sure that you have adequate stock of that stuff to be protecting yourself as you're out engaging with people is uh, important. To, to what extent can you carry the virus on your shoes? We, we think a lot in showing homes about the number, of, like the, the actual foot traffic through the property. So I could limit the way in which people enter the property in terms of the space between us and the number of parties in the property at one time, but what are they bringing in and leaving and how sure. left behind can COVID or can the coronavirus be? There obviously is some potential of risk of transmission of COVID-19 on surfaces, mm -hmm. but Definitely, um, as far as our best understanding today exists, mostly uh, the disease is transmitted by direct contact between two people. It's and people. so, right. yeah, and so, um, you know, viruses um, really can't live for a long time outside of a host. Um, and so, you know, the, the amount of time that it takes for a coronavirus uh, to no longer be viable um, when it's on a surface, um, varies depending on what that surface is. Um, it doesn't do a great job at surviving on most surfaces. And even if it does survive, uh, you know, if you think about two people interacting and, and droplets potentially being in the air and getting inhaled, that's a very good way to transmit COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, when there's COVID-19 on a surface that you interact with, that still has to make its way into your body. And so, mm -hmm. As long as you are practicing very good hygiene, regular washing of your hands, trying not to touch your face, um, especially around your nose and mouth, um, and a mask helps with that too, um, then you're, as long as you're taking those precautions and, and being careful about it, um, the risk of transmission on surfaces drops to a very low level. Yeah. Okay. That that's great feedback because I I do think it reiterates what all of us are knowing and hearing. But there's so much noise. Just a good extra reminder of it really is people to people, and we're all yearning for the you know a house party again. But it's going to be a minute because that's not changing. <laughs> that's um, right. And is it fair to say you know as things are opening up and and there's divisiveness in everybody's perspective about that. The reality is the virus itself is not changing. We're just having to figure out how we're going to live with it. Is that an accurate portrayal of where we are today? Yeah, I would say that that's fair. I mean, I, I don't think anybody um, ever thought that we were going to all stay in our homes until COVID-19 didn't exist anymore, right? Yeah. That's, that's never been one of the realistic possibilities or kind of the options that are on the table. And so um, I think it is a, you know, it's a delicate balancing act. Obviously, you know, there are lots of, of adverse impacts of, of having everybody restricted to their homes um, and lots of downstream and, and difficult to imagine um, sort of secondary consequences that we all experience as a result of the economic pressures that that creates. Um, and so I think, you know, we're, uh, nobody knows perfectly, you know, how this process will go. Um, or what the impacts will be, you know, on transmission. Um, I think, you know, certainly um, everybody has a personal responsibility to continue to practice as much so social distancing and good hygiene and the protective measures that we just talked about as they can, not only for their own benefit, but because as you're out there interacting in society, you create the risk of, of transmitting an infection to someone else. And so, it's important to remember that that's, those are decisions you're not just making for yourself. Um, there are also decisions that you're making for other people. Um, some of those people uh, are people who may be immunocompromised or have other underlying health factors um, that make them a higher risk for experiencing a bad outcome. And so it's important to keep that in mind as you're out there interacting in the world. Um, if, if you can't do it for yourself, um, do it for all of those other people that you care about uh, who may not be as prepared to, to defend 
against an infection as you are. I do want to call attention to the fact that, um, you know, there is a lot of news and there are lots of resources that people are reading. Some of them are really accurate. Some of them are not. But I know that you guys produce a resource with Justin down there, um, which is a new podcast that you launched with Jeremy, your chief medical officer, and Justin, who is not a doctor. And it's very much not a doctor. It's doctor and not a doctor is the, <laughs> is the theme behind it. Tell yeah, us a little it's just bit called about, Doctor, Not a Doctor. If I send the members to listen, what are they going to hear if they listen to that? Yeah, well, we just recorded our fifth episode, which we, we joked was probably four more episodes than we thought we would do. Yeah. Um, we I think the idea is, <laughs> well, good. Well, I, I think that you captured it. There's a lot of information. There's, there's constant news and the, the need for sort of refreshed news. Um, I think the demands is sometimes greater than, uh, th than there is new news to share. And so sometimes yeah. you, at any given time, you turn it on and they're entertaining something that's maybe thin or there's not a lot of research behind it. And so, uh, yeah, Jeremy's one of our doctors, actually the founder of Remedy, very smart, um, very much rooted in evidence-based medicine. And so we said, you can kind of have a, uh, you know, take the temperature of the week of the, whatever the topics are. And so he takes the time to research those things from credible sources. And then we'll just put, you know, three or four of the most common questions. So like this week, we talked about uh, antibody testing and the latest thinking about that. We talked about what does it mean for states reopening and what's the likely impact of that. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about, you know, this is this treatment remdesivir, which I think I'm saying correctly that everyone's talked about, well, what does the research actually, you know, say about this particular treatment? And so that's the idea. Pick three or four topics, try to cover it in 30 minutes, get his perspective. Uh, we can skip sort of political commentary and all those things and just hear from a doctor and then whenever possible, try to have some levity so that it's not overly serious. Cause it's kind of like, it's serious enough right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we all need something, so. Yeah, amen. Uh, any anticipation or final comments maybe about what school looks like in the fall? I know we have many, many parent, parent realtors out there. I have two people who are probably standing right outside that door <laughs> waiting for me to come out of this room. What do you, any, any anticipation on that front? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's still an open question. I mean, this this yeah. is um, obviously this is one of the the biggest things on everybody's mind, right? It's it's hard to go back to work and reopen the economy if the kids are all still home. Um, and so, we'll be watching just like everybody else to see um, you know how this thing unfolds uh, and how well positioned we are to have people back in you know in direct interaction with each other in those kinds of environments as yeah. we head into the fall. Yeah, well, that was a that was a good non-answer because none of us know, and that's accept that's fully acceptable and totally understandable. Um, I want to remind everybody that they can uh, get COVID nineteen testing and they can get antibody testing through Remedy. They visit myremedy.com if they need to have an initial they need to have an initial appointment with you guys and then be referred out for the testing. Your testing yep. center is at Tony Berger Center. Does mm -hmm. that all sound right? That's right. Yep. Okay. Awesome. And for ABOR members, they have a credit on their account as part of their membership with the Austin Board of Realtors. That credit can be applied to any interaction with Remedy, including this testing. We just want to continue to encourage you guys to get the care that you need. Even outside of this COVID testing, Remedy is available for that on-call service in the ways that you need it that are totally unrelated to the pandemic. So kiddo's got an ear infection, not feeling well otherwise, and it's maybe not COVID, you should still get checked out. And we want to provide that uh, a level of access to remedy for that. So we would strongly encourage everybody to take advantage of the member benefit and of that service. And let me just again wrap up by saying thank you guys. Thank you for your hard work, um, trying to keep our community safe, keeping us up to date on things that are real and factual. You guys are doing a really excellent job. Thanks so much for being a good partner to us. Thanks very much, Emily. Thanks for having us.